There you go. There we go. All right, good morning, everybody. Today's gonna to be kind of a basic how to get there talk about the gear we need to get from the skin to the lesion, and then I'm gonna stop. All right, none of those work. So no disclosures. Um, I do mention companies, brand names and such in this talk. They're all in alphabetical order. There's no particular favoritism. And I tried to stick mostly with what we have in the lab available. So I may have left other opportunities out. So what we're gonna talk about today is choosing the right tool for the job. We have all pounded a square peg into a round hole uh, in the past, but we remember that that's not efficient and it's often not fun. So we're gonna talk about how to get round pegs and round holes today. So here's in honor of John Sotaro, a few quotes. Uh, ben Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And then a little more modern, Russell Wilson, the separation is in the preparation. So don't set yourself up for a long day, choose the right tool for the job. So we're gonna talk about skin to lesions. So we're gonna talk about access, sheaths, guides, wires, microcatheters, and guide extensions. I'm gonna leave the algorithms off today, but that's an excellent paper by Rob Riley at Al uh, that you should all have in your library. So for access, ultrasound is key. Uh, you should definitely learn how to use it. Every case, every femoral case, and even radial cases, it uh, decreases the time to access despite what people think. And it's acknowledged that practice. There's really no reason not to use it. Um, micropuncture needles are standard. And the key with those is to make sure you visualize the wires because we've all had wires go into circumflex femoral vessels and small vessels and inferior epigastrics. And that can be disastrous when placing sheaths. So the radial and arm access sheaths are hydrophilic um, and the sheath to artery ratio is the major determination for endothelial and arterial injury with ensuing thrombosis and vessel closure. Um, sheaths comes in different sizes and different lengths. Longer sheaths significantly increase support. You can increase your support with a 45 from the groin, one to two French size larger than your guide would be. Uh, and they also allow greater torque control of your catheters, so tortuous aortoiliacs, uh, as do braided and hydrophilic sheaths from the groin. So one of the things that's important is to remember the relationship in the stiffness between the sheath and the wire. So it's often easy to get access with a micropuncture kit. And if things are very tortuous, you frequently can get up with a glide wire, but then where do you go? Because the glide wire is so soft, a lot of times the sheath won't track. So one of the things to do is to take a glide wire and a glide catheter, slide the glide catheter up because they have similarities in their stiffness. And then through the glide catheter, put a long stiff wire of your choice and then a long hydrophilic sheath. And with this, you can get through almost every tortuosity. Sheaths come in different sizes. Uh, Jeopardy quiz on the bottom with all the colors of the French size coordinators. And it's important to know that the sheath size is measured by the inner diameter. So the outer diameter is actually the size that's going through the vessel. So femoral sheaths, we mostly use 10 centimeters, but if there's some aortoiliac tortuosity, 25 will get you to the bifurcation usually or just above and 45 will usually get you up to the diaphragm. Guiding catheters also come in different French sizes. We don't use much five French guiding catheters. They're limited shapes, limited options. They're pretty flimsy by most standards. And the major issue with them is if you start to do a case and you run into trouble, there are limited options because of their size compatibilities. Six French has become really the standard because it's balanced between size, push, and options. Um, you can fit two modest balloons through there. Uh, you can do serial stenting of bifurcations, but not simultaneous. Um, multiple wires, but typically only one microcatheter in a wire. The exception, I believe, is the Caravelle, where you can fit two in. 
Um, and just for reference, CSI 1.5 roto will go 1.75. You can push, it's very tight in the 0.9 and 1.4 laser. Seven French is kind of the go-to for radial interventions with any kind of complexity. You can place two stents simultaneously. You can use larger balloons. You can put two microcatheters, although it's fairly tight in the larger 175 roto and the 17 laser. Um, brachytherapy, you can also do through a seven French, but uh, I was burned once and I will tell you if there's a lot of tortuosity and bending of the guide, the brachycatheter therapy will stall. Uh, so anything but a simple straight approach is probably best reserved for eight French, and that's typically femoral access. Eight French, you can fit and do almost anything we want, um, except for the largest roto size. I can't remember when the last time I used a 225 or 238 roto, uh, or put two stents in a balloon or trifurcation stenting with a nine French. So. Um, Compex PCI Solutions is the name of an app for the iPhone, which is actually pretty interesting. Uh, these people in, I believe it's Italy, uh, took the time to size all of the gear going through the guides and the guides and see what fits and what won't fit. So you can run simulations if you want to know if an IBIS and a microcatheter will fit, which microcatheter, two microcatheters, so it's a good resource. So the standard length of a guide is 100 centimeters. Uh, there's some 120s, which are typically multi-purpose. Uh, pigtails are longer at 125. And there are limited sizes of extra long guides in 120. Typically, you don't need them from the femoral unless someone is 6'6 six, six or taller. Uh, but some long-limbed people uh, with some tortuosity in the arch, you do need longer guides from the wrist. And there are also 90 centimeter guides, which we have typically for going distally through vein grafts, or if you're going to use them to externalize a wire in a chronic total occlusion, because it allows more wire length to be visible outside the body. You can manufacture a guide by cutting it. We've done that in the past when the wrong shape is available. This is done typically by taking a sheet, one French size smaller, cutting off a four or five centimeter piece from the middle of the sheet, uh, dilating it with a dilator one size larger, cutting your guide catheter, taking out the requisite length of material, and then putting the guide catheter into both sides of the sheet. And then some people will wrap uh, tape around that to add some security. It is pretty flimsy. You shouldn't torque it based on the collar. You have to torque it above where the graft has been placed that you just put in. Um, but in a pinch, it does work out. So we use guide catheters to support what we're doing. It's to get the gear there and to support it going to where we need it to go. So that's related to both the diameter of the guide uh, and the length of the sheet. So there's really two kinds of guide support, passive and active. Uh, passive just relies on the intrinsic stiffness of the guide. So the Judkins guides are typical examples of that. The JR4 goes in, and when the JR4 guide bounces out, it's simply because there's not enough stiffness in the guide coming around. Uh, you can improve this a little bit with a radial approach because it's a more direct from the left side to go from the left subclavian through the arch and across to the right point area. So sometimes you have some inline support uh, with that. Um, active support tends to rely on opposite side push. So you wanna make sure your guide is big enough to reach the opposite side of the aorta and the extra backups uh, are typical of those. The Judkins curve left is another one that we have um, but typically, there's a trade-off between support and safety. So the more supportive guides are bigger and deeper and more aggressive, uh, and thus they're less safe. They can dive in. They can be sucked in when you're pulling equipment back. And you also have to certainly be careful about osteolesions. And just remember, because a guide that engages easily for diagnostic case may not surprise or may not provide the support you need for the procedure to get the gear where you need to. So you may have to choose different catheters. But from a safety perspective, that's why diagnostic catheters 
are typically passive support. Uh, and the great example of this, which I love to cite, is how many times the TIG falls out of the left coronary when you're trying to inject because the passive support is just not strong enough frequently. So we talked about the balance of risk and reward. So what do you wanna assess when choosing a guide? You wanna look at the takeoff of the coronary ostea. Are they up going, down going, or horizontal? And what's the landing zone of your guide like? Is there a lot of disease? Is there a long left main? Is there a short left main? Is it small? Is it large? Um, there are guides with side holes. Uh, I am not particularly a big fan of side holes. There are other things you can do to de-risk your guide. Uh, to make sure you don't inject into an osteal stenosis or a narrowed vessel, um, but they do have some limiting effect on injections in terms of creating a hydraulic dissection. Um, we talked a little bit about radial support going from the right coronary from the left arm, and the opposite tends to be true as well. Uh, going from the right arm for the left corner, you tend to get a little bit better push. Uh, but that also depends on the width and the shape of the aorta. Uh, the most important thing is to set yourself up for success. When you get a guide and the guide is tenuous, think about the support that you're going to need to finish the case, not to do the angiogram. So you may take a Judkins right that fits beautifully in there, but it's a tortuous calcified vessel, you're not gonna have enough support to get what you need to do. Uh, so that might be the time before you get halfway through the case uh, to go ahead and reach for a more supportive or aggressive guide. So longer guides in terms of numbers, so EBU4 versus 375 versus 35 or AL2 versus AL1, and also increased French support. So um, the guide is also about the vectors of push. This is a nice schematic from Bobby Ye, uh, who kind of shows that the direction of push is not necessarily the direction that your guide is pushing. You want to align those for maximum force. So uh, the ways to do that are either to change your guide or change the shape of your guide. So if you have a downgoing circ, and you chose a short guide and it's pushing up into the left main, it's gonna be very difficult to push things off the roof of the left main and bank them into the circumflex. You're better off taking a long guide, pulling it up, getting the vector of the guide pointing down into the circumflex and even adding a guide extension, which we'll mention later. The other thing you can do sometimes is change the shape of the vessel by putting in a stiffer buddy wire and straightening it out as well. So this is just a, another example of a retroflex circumflex, how just by pulling the guide up sometimes gives you a better push vector and then the guide extension as we spoke about. So this is an example here. Unfortunately, it doesn't project well, but this is one way to get a more supportive guide. So it's actually, you take the long guide in, what they're doing here is passing the stiff back end of the guide wire, which should not come out, and you can see the guide kind of pops in there. So I'm gonna let that play one more time here. So here's the stiff wire, here's the guide here, clocking it around, pushing the wire down so it pops this tip down and pulling it up a little bit. And now it's deep and strong in the coronary artery. Um, so this works for the EBUs as well as the ALs and XB rights. So you can use it on both sides. But now that you have an aggressive guide, um, you want to be able to keep your risk low. So never inject without a clear undampened pressure waveform. And I put that twice on purpose because sometimes, oh, it won't matter. I'll just be softly. You end up with problems. Don't start off with a high power injection, soft and slow buildup. You can actually put a guide wire down the vessel, uh, preferably with a distal loop and back out your guide wire. So that's one way to de-risk your guide position. The other thing you have to be careful of is you get focused on the lesion that you're working on, you're pulling balloons back and you're not remembering what the guide position is like. Um, I look to look on, the larger frame sizes so I can see the wire tip in the guide when we're working to make sure that the guide's not being 
drawn down into the coronary artery. And this is especially important if you're positioning a stent, you're coned in, you have an aggressive guide position, the stent's distal, you pull it back, and the guide comes in as you're pulling the stent back and you end up with a guide dissection in the osteal vessel. The other thing you can do is use what's called a bumper wire. You can place a wire through the end of the guide but out into the aortic cusp that will act as a bumper to keep the guide from going in. And then when you need that aggressive guide position, you can take that bumper wire back into the guide and get your more aggressive position. Uh, you can wire both the LAD and the circumflex or similarly, you can wire a conus branch and the right uh, if the conus is off the proximal right. Um, the other thing to remember is when you're taking the guide out, especially AL guides, the guides can jump down the coronary artery or if you've placed an osteal stent. So one of the easy things to do is just take your picture. Don't worry about a wire out shot. Pull your wire back to make sure there's no distal perforation. Typically, you're not going to have pleating from an osteal stent. And then remove the guide over the coronary wire and then pull the coronary wire out as a way to secure the guide without having it jump down the artery and not dinging your osteal stent. Um, one of the common things that happens is we can't pass the radio guide either because of vasospasm or tortuosity with what's called a razor edge phenomenon. And that's simply because the wire is floating around the inside of the guide catheter. The tip of the guide catheter is much stiffer and less tapered than a diagnostic catheter. And it frequently will refuse to cross those lesions. Uh, you can use balloon assisted tracking by putting a two or two five by 20 millimeter balloon at the end of the guide, putting it up to eight to 10 atmospheres and then pushing the guide over the balloon. Uh, it does require exchanging the typically 038 guide wire for coronary wire through the lesions and then you track the coronary wire up with the balloon. When you cross it, you can change back to your regular 038. Uh, or what I've become more favor of is the telescoping technique. We have the Terumo angled glide. It's 125 centimeters you put through and it fills that gap in the guide with uh, some lubricious catheter and frequently you're able to track through. I've had one instance where that did not work in balloon assisted tracking did. Um, people have also used uh, multi-purpose diagnostic two French smaller than the guide. Um, Cordis has their railway system, which is basically a dilator that goes through. Uh, and the Cook Beacon is another similar to the Terumo uh, angle glide. It's a tapered angiography catheter uh, that's also available at Yale. Um, other ways to improve your guide support, uh, buddy wire, we're all familiar with, uh, the wiggle wire, which I think many of you have seen now, uh, I'll show it a little bit later, but it's a way of distal anchoring, uh, that will improve your guide support, or you can use an anchor wire, uh, buddy wire would be in the same vessel or an anchor wire would be in another vessel to aid stability to your guide. You can put a balloon on that secondary wire. Uh, if you're in the same vessel, you can push the balloon up distal to your target lesion, uh, and that will add distal stability to the guide, or you can go out a side branch, typically a conus or an RV marginal on the right, uh, or a diagonal or upper marginal in the left coronary system. And then the last thing you can do is a guide extension. Uh, so this is kind of an example uh, of what an anchor balloon might look like. The balloon goes up here, keeps your guide anchored here, allowing you more push to cross here. Uh, and this is a distal anchor in the same balloon. The balloon is up distal to the lesion, allowing you again, more push and anchoring of the guide. Um, this is a comparison of the sheathless guides. We have the OCAP at Yale. Um, so the key point here is that the six and a half French OCAP guide has the same outer diameter um, as basically a five French sheath, which they should have put here. Uh, but the ID is 070, uh, which is pretty large. Um, the key thing is the seven and a half and eight and a half. So the seven and a half, basically think of it as a six French system and outer diameter 
but allows you about seven and a half French inner. And the eight and a half French, think of it as a seven French going into the wrist, but almost a nine French inner diameter. Um, I found them quite soft to use, but they do allow the volume to get through the equipment that you might need to do the case. Uh, we talked a little bit about vectors and back wall supports. The guide extensions also provide that opportunity by lengthening your guide to allow some back wall support. And as we had shown in that schematic earlier, allows a better coaxial vector for the push in relation to crossing the lesion. It typically is about the same as increasing by about one French size, um, but it also reduces the lumen caliber by a French size. So when you're putting equipment in, you need to remember that the size of the guide extension is smaller. Um, inchworm technique, I think most of you are familiar with, is just inflating a balloon partly in the distal segment. And then as that balloon is deflated, tracking the guide extension down. Um, and then you can use that also in combination with a distal balloon anchor. And you can frequently get a guide extension very far down the coronary artery. Um, as before, only inject when you see a clear pressure waveform. Um, and also be alert for occlusive or semi-occlusive distal ischemia, because remember the guide extension is taking up a large portion of that coronary lumen. Now, uh, the one caveat uh, is if you do not deploy your stent and you decide to pull it back in, um, sometimes pulling it through the guide extension will unroof the proximal portion of the stent from the delivery balloon and then mangle and strip it. So it's preferred to really remove your guide extension and then pull the stent back into the guide itself and then remove it. Uh, one of the issues that can evolve is the guide extension is a wire basically outside the TUI and that gets wrapped up with the wire that's down the coronary. So remember to just put it under a wet towel and pull it out of your working field. Um, Usually not an issue to advance the proximal collar outside of the guide catheter, unless you're working way down a vein graft. Um, but that is one thing you really don't want to do. Um, and then you can do the uh, triple telescope or the grandmother, mother, daughter technique uh, where you have an eight guide and then an eight guide extension, and then you can put a six guide extension through that. So that adds a great amount of stiffness. It also increases the length. Um, some of the other uses besides delivery, you can give selective contrast. Uh, if you have clear pressure waveforms and you need to selectively inject the CERC versus the LAD, or there's a, an anomalous coronary that you need to engage, sometimes it provides you the extra length. Um, similar going through a TAVR valve uh, or to engage when you can get a wire down, but you just can't get the catheter close. Uh, in the past, we've used it for thrombectomy. I think that's probably not a good idea given our current tools and equipment. Uh, and I think uh, there are better ways to do that. Um, removal of entrapped equipment is key. So a lot of times you can put a guide extension down if a balloon got stuck, say, uh, to cut the shaft of the balloon, put the guide extension over the balloon and the wire, pass the guide extension all the way to where the balloon has gotten stuck uh, and pull. Uh, it facilitates reverse cart in CTO by giving you a guide extension target much closer to the lesion you're traversing rather than having to go all the way through the vessel. And it also, when you're doing anti-grade dissection re-entry, uh, to place it in the subintimal space intentionally to plug the blood flow from expanding your hematoma and moving your subintimal space away from the true lumen, making it more difficult to reaccess. And this is just a compatibility with other equipment that I put for everybody's reference. Um, guide extensions are quite good for the radial approach since we use smaller guides, they allow. Uh, significant increased push. And this is just a gram force chart of that. Um, 
There are three that we have in our labs and there are three that we have available. So um, in alphabetical order, uh, this is the Medtronic telescope, uh, but basically they're all similar construction. Um, there's a distal marker. There is a very hydrophilic distal portion, and then there's a proximal collar, and they usually have markers on them similar to balloons at 90 and 100 centimeters from the tip. Uh, this is the guidezilla, which is also available to us, uh, and the guide liner. Uh, one of the things that is important is if you have to pass a second wire, uh, frequently that wire will get stuck here somewhere along this collar uh, and prolapse and mangle the tip. So one of the ways that you can get around that when you need a second wire is actually to put a microcatheter up uh, with the wire in it, but not extended and then place the microcatheter into this rapid exchange section and then bring your wire out uh, because that will frequently pass through here unobstructed. So this is just a new kind or a different kind of guide liner called a trap liner. This is a unique device, the only one of its kind. Um, so what this allows you to do is it has a trap balloon incorporated proximally to a guide extension, which is extending out here. So that is uh, a facilitator for gear exchange. And we'll talk a little bit more about trap balloons or trap liners. Um, basically, this is the trap balloon or the trapper, trap on, trap off. Um, but it's a single wire shaft uh, with a balloon that's two millimeters, uh, a marker band, and it's very compliant. And what we do is bring this up around to either the 90 centimeter or the 100 centimeter. You don't need to watch it. You just bring it to the dot. So with the yellow extension out, it's 90. Push that yellow extension back and go all the way to this mark, and it's 100 and it allows you to inflate the balloon, pin the wire. You can pull out uh, balloons, stents, microcatheters over the wire equipment, uh, exchange, and then let that down. The key thing is when you take the trapper balloon out, it often entrains air into the two-way valve. So always remember to bleed back after you remove this device pretty vigorously. So I'm going to get to coronary guide wires here. So this is kind of the tools of our trade and the basics of how we get to and do things. Uh, there are probably 100 or more choices uh, that we may even have available here. Um, most simple lesions, the wires are so advanced and so good now um, that the choice of wire is probably not that important. But as the complexity of the lesions increases, the importance of wire choice then becomes magnified. And uh, similar to, you can't always use the guide catheter the same shape as the diagnostic catheter, the bend that you initially put on the wire to traverse the coronary to get to the lesion may be very different from the bend that you need to get across the lesion. So that's one of the ways microcatheters can help is to use a wire shape to get to the lesion and then use a different shape to get across the lesion. That's one of the theoretical benefits of nitinol wires uh, is that they don't get dinged as much. They may retain their tip shape a little bit better. Although as we will see in it a little bit further, the tip characteristics of those wires are such that there is a stainless steel shaping tip at the end. So the important thing is to remember what you want the wire to do. If you want push, if you want crossability, if you want hydrophilicity. Um, so change the wire characteristics depending on what you want the wire to do. And don't be stingy. Uh, change your wires easily, just you should change your guide catheters easily to maximize your chance for easy, simple success. Uh, the one thing that's important is just like de-risking your guide, you want to de-risk your wires. So if you're using a specialty wire 
uh, a very hydrophilic, a stiff hydrophilic, a penetrating wire. Once its mission is accomplished, you should swap that out to a safe workhorse wire to complete the case. So there's really three characteristics that determine the feel and purpose of the wire. So one is the core design. Uh, so the shape of the inner mandrel of the wire and where it tapers. One is the coil design. So uh, how far the coils up, whether the coils are hydrophilic, hydrophobic. And the third is coating. So there's a polymer or plastic jacket on some wires making them highly lubricious. So the core design is really this central core. Um, and it really affects the support. A thick, long core will give you more support. A thinner core will allow you more flexibility to go around tortuosity. The core also determines the steering characteristics and the tracking characteristics of the wire. Um, it's typically a high tensile stainless steel. Although nitinol has come to the market in several wires, the run through and the Manamo are the ones at Yale that are nitinol. Um, it allows much better flexibility through tortuosity and tends to be more durable and has less shape retention. So this is a good example about what core taper means. So if you have the wire atop with a nice smooth taper, that bend is gonna be such that you can track that wire very easily through tortuosity. The wire at the bottom is a stiff delivery wire, but it has a very short taper. So the distal tip is very flexible. The proximal is very stiff. That's going to result in pushing the flexible area into the lesion, but the stiff is not going to wanna to bend and you're gonna end up prolapsing your wire out of the lesion you want to cross. And then a tapered core is one thing, a parabolic core, which we have, I believe it's on our pilot wires mostly, uh, is the smoothest gradual taper of all. Coils are placed on the outside of the wire to maintain the diameter. So it's uniform from tip back to the delivery portion of the wire. Um, it also allows greater torque control of the wire depending on the coil design. And this is what gives you that tactile feedback. It gives you some increased friction on the tip of the wire so that you can sense what the wire feels like. There's really two tip styles. One is called core to tip, where it's the same stainless steel core. Uh, one has a shaping ribbon, which is a very flexible, softer tip uh, that allows you just to shape the tip to your desired. Um, this is the typical softest wire. As you get stiffer and higher gram and more penetrating wires, you'll get core to tip and stiffer cores. So we talk a little bit about how to shape the guide wire. It's easiest to just place it through the introducer and gently bend the tip to your desired length and angle. Um, for the nitinol wires, there's a company tool because the uh, tip is very easily broken by shaping it hard against the introducer. So that's usually a bend for smaller bends, use the smaller area of the shaping tool for larger bends, the larger circumference area. And it's kind of gradually increased it. The typical wire bend on the pre-shaped wires is about three millimeters with a 45 to 50 degree bend. Uh, remember the bend is related to the diameter of what you're trying to cross. Uh, CTO tip where you're essentially navigating through plaque is typically a one millimeter tip with a 30 or 45 degree bend, about as small a tip and bend as you can see. Uh, wires are cheap, the sections are costly. So remember, please swap out your specialty wires for your workhorse wires. Uh, coatings are a big thing. So you can have multiple coatings either hydrophobic coatings with coils that allows you the best tactile feedback from the wire, hydrophilic coating 
uh, becomes a gel with water activation. But as you become more and more hydrophilic, you get less and less tactile feedback. And then the most aggressive is a polymer coating. Um, so this is a, a nice chart showing no coating, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and polymer jacketed. So the jacketed wires have a black polymer coating and a hydrophilic coating. So that's kind of the, the pilot series, the whisper series, um, PT graphics, the hydrophilic coating uh, really is kind of the Xi'an is the wire that we have that's best exemplified that. And then hydrophobic, uh, some of the penetrating wires, uh, the Miracle Brothers series, and no coding, uh, some of the basic workhorse wires. So I know you've all wondered how they measure the tip gram. It's a, a simple little algorithm where they have this device here on the left. They put the wire in the middle, they push it down until the tip deflects two millimeters and whatever the gram weight on the top pushing down that wire is, uh, tells you what the tip gram is for the wire. So most of the workhorse wires we have are in the 0.5 to 1.5 range. Uh, some of the stiffer wires that we have are in the two to four gram range. And some of the super stiff wires that we have are in the 12 to 14 or even 20 to 30 gram weight. So wiring techniques, there's really three common techniques for, or two common techniques for wiring corners that are open. Slide and steer is basically pushing the wire forward and steering uh, based on your outline of the artery. If you find buckling or resistance, you stop, pull back, redirect. The key with this is to keep the tip free and minimize the buckling. If you're buckling, you're digging into the side of the vessel and that's when you will have dissections unless that's your desired outcome. Um, the prolapse or the safety loop as we used to call it, uh, is one way to keep the safe workhorse wire even safer. Uh, it's usually a click flick of the wrist as you just entered a tiny side branch in advance uh, and it prolapses the tip and allows for quick traversing of the rest of the vessel. Uh, the safety loop greatly diminishes the risk for any kind of distal perforation. And as long as it's not pushed aggressively, uh, it's very safe. Uh, one of the things that you can do is to use this prolapse to your advantage in traversing stents uh, that you've just placed. Uh, you typically would take a wire with a 60 degree bend longer than the diameter of the vessel. Uh, you put that in the vessel, it will prolapse, and then you pull it back to unprolapse it until you reach your desired location to advance across the stent. Um, and then there's two other things that are useful in specialty areas, hairpin wire and a deflection balloon, which I'll show here. Um, so this is one of the difficulties we had talked about tip design and core design. You wanna wire a retroflex circumflex, but every time you do it, the wire goes forward and prolapses. Uh, so you should choose a more gradual tip uh, and a softer, more conforming core. So the example that they've chosen here is a Pilot 200, but any of the Pilot series, Whisper series would be uh, very helpful for this um, to make it around. You can use an angled microcatheter. So we have the Supercross here. Uh, you can get something called a Swift Ninja from IR. The Venture catheter is back on the market, but I don't believe we have it. And these are the two kind of interesting ways to do it. Simply put a deflecting balloon up so your wire can't prolapse. Uh, and the other thing is the hairpin loop or the reversed guide wire, which I have a little video of here. So this is a microcatheter and a wire. You just bend the wire, put a little tip bend there, and then you insert the wire bent back on itself through the TUI with the guide catheter. And what you do here is you advance that loop down the artery and then pull it back. The tip prolapses here and goes in. Obviously you don't wanna put this loop distally in the artery. This is basically useful mostly for retroflex circumflexes. 
uh, different wire techniques for CTO. Uh, we talk about drilling, uh, which is a quick rotation back and forth of the wire. This is not drilling when you're turning the wire 10, 15, 20, 30 times in the same direction. Uh, the important thing to remember there is if your tip is fixed, you can break the coils and break the tip off of the wire. Um, and then this kind of quick back and forth rotation sometimes is helpful to wiggle across stent struts when you're trying to cross. Penetration is typically used with a high gram hydrophilic tip, very stiff, uncoated wire. The typical would be the Confianza CP12, Hornet 14, or the Estados. And this is a small bend directing you where you want to go, and it's just push. You direct it, you engage it, and push. And this is typically to get across the proximal or distal cap going retrograde. Uh, push and torque has been proposed a lot for the Gaia or Judo type wires as parallel wiring within the CT segment. Um, it's a, similar to how we would ordinarily do wire, but these wires are very torqueable. Um, it's a 60 degree turn on the wire and a gentle push and probe. If the wire buckles, you're meeting resistance or calcification. Uh, in the CTO segment, you pull the wire back a millimeter or two millimeters, take the buckle off the wire, retorque it, another 60 degrees in a different direction, and then re-advance to slowly and methodically make your way across a CTO. This is kind of as used to be known as the Japanese style, um, but it's a very slow and meticulous way of getting things done. Um, wire escalation, uh, we've all kind of done this. You start with a soft, simple wire, you escalate to a heavier gram tip and then a polymer jacketed and then a penetration wire. Uh, but the key with all of these things is just like your guide, you want to de-risk your guide. If you're really buried in there, you won't want to de-escalate your wire to a safety wire once you've done what you want to accomplish. Multiple wires, uh, frequently when we have bifurcation lesions or stability wires, or you know, we've had three or four, I don't think I've had five yet, but four wires in an artery. Uh, you have to keep them oriented and separated so you don't get wire wrap, uh, no spinning inside the guide uh, or anywhere proximal to the lesion because you will wrap the wires. Uh, you also need to treat the guide extension as a wire to prevent the wires from wrapping there. And I usually just put wet towels around them and go from uh, superior to inferior or proximal to distal so it's very clear which wire belongs in which towel. Um, there are people who also will label these towels or gauze with a marker to show which wire it is. Um, so the categories we've talked about, workhorse wires, supportive wires, jacketed wires, penetrating wires, and specialty wires. The characteristics of the workhorse that we have, we usually use the run-through is the most common in our lab. Uh, people still use the BMW every once in ATW. Uh, the most uh, advanced wires are really uh, the composite core, which allow better torque control. That's the Samurai and the Xi'an Blue. Uh, and then there's a nitinol wire with a composite core, which is the Manamo. We talked a little bit before for difficult lesions to cross. Uh, sometimes these workhorse wires don't do it. Uh, the next risk level, if you will, is to use the hydrophilic workhorse wires. Uh, so that's the Samurai RC, uh, the Sion wire, uh, and some people have used Fielder uh, as well. Uh, the Suo is a very, very soft uh, hydrophilic workhorse wire for extreme tortuosity and usually uh, collateral wiring. And then the next would be to use a soft, non-tapered jacketed wire. Uh, and the examples we have in our lab are the Sion Black and the Fielder FC, the Pilot 50 and the Whisper. Uh, and then the last, which is not on this slide, would be a stiffer non-tapered polymer jacketed wire, such as the Pilot 200 or the Gladius Mongo. 
Uh, supportive wires uh, for delivering equipment typically have a very soft tip, but a very robust core. Uh, they don't conform to the vessel well, they don't track well. So this is typically something that you would place your wire across the lesion with the aid of a microcatheter and then swap out for one of these wires to assist you in completing the case. Um, this is also a good wire to use as a buddy wire to change the direction and angulation of your vessels. Uh, we have the Grand Slam uh, in our lab. We also had Iron Man. I haven't seen a mailman in centuries. Jacketed wires are very similar to workhorse wires, but the coils are covered by a hydrophilic polymer plastic jacket. Uh, they have excellent tracking through tortuosity. They have very little resistance and they have very little feel. So it's very important to swap these out when you've done your task to a regular workhorse wire. There's high risks to perforate the end of the vessel. Uh, they do knuckle well and it's good for rapidly traversing the subintimal space. Uh, and typically to penetrate uh, or perforate the side of a vessel with these wires is extremely unusual. Uh, it's usually an end vessel issue. Uh, but again, uh, our lab, Fielder Series, Fighter, Gladius, Pilot, uh, and then the Whisper. Penetrating wires we talked about, very stiff distal tip. This is only to puncture. These are not to traverse long segments of vessel. Uh, and once you've done the job, please swap these out. These will easily go through the sidewall of a vessel without much sensation or pop, uh, especially in the tapered tips uh, like the Confianza Pro 12 and the Hornet 14. Uh, remember that your tip force is related to the tip load to the tip area. So if you have a 10 gram wire, but the tip area is half, uh, your force is much greater. So it's the difference of being stepped on in a sneaker or a stiletto. And again, swap these wires out. These are the ones that we have in our lab, the CP12, 14, and the XS20 and 40. Hopefully we will get shortly. Um, we talked a little bit about the SUO, but I wanted to show you the wiggle wire. I think it's a very useful wire to greatly increase your guide support with some distal anchoring. And it also has pretty good shaft support for delivery of equipment. Uh, there's a three centimeter, very soft coil tip, followed by a pretty robust wiggle where over a three millimeter course, there are sinusoidal branches over the next three centimeters. Uh, and that allows distal anchoring in vessels, obviously that are smaller than three millimeters. One of the other uses that you can do with this is to cross, <coughs> excuse me, is to cross uh, stented segments because it will lift the balloon away from the stent struts. Sometimes larger, stiffer balloons are prone to bury themselves. And this may help with that. Uh, other specialty wires, um, rotowire and viper wire are somewhat similar. Uh, there's floppy and support wires. The floppy wires give less bias, which is typically preferred. Um, they are smaller than our standard wires. So the, the rotowire is 009, the viper wire is an 012. They both have 014 tips with brakes at the end so that the uh, atherectomy device, you cannot push off the tip of the wire. Uh, the exception to this is if you're rotoing and you keep burring at the tip of the wire, you can actually shear it. So that's an important concept to make sure your tip is far away from where you're doing your atherectomy. Uh, I've not heard or seen that happen uh, with the orbital CSI device. Um, microcatheters are great. They allow a much improvement in your ability to pass wires. They greatly reduce any friction. Uh, they're really technologically unbelievable as are the wires that we use. They're 
basically polymer jacketed on the inside to reduce friction. Uh, these should be flushed before to increase that. Uh, and then also because they stiffen your wire, uh, the closer you advance to the tip, the more penetrating power the tip of the wire has. So that is something that you can use to your advantage, but it's also something you need to be aware of when you're trying to be gentle and soft. Um, they also tend to not kink and not prolapse. Uh, so sometimes these can be very helpful in wiring tortuous or angulated vessels. Uh, they act as a placeholder. So once you've reached where you want to go, uh, you can then change your wires uh, to de-escalate to a softer, kinder wire or change to an atherectomy wire. They also allow the distal delivery of drugs, uh, either by removing the wire in a single lumen or the dual lumen catheters, uh, twin pass and now Sasuke. Uh, there's multiple others that'll be here in the next years. Uh, you can inject through the over the wire lumen and have the tracking of the microcatheter through a monorail lumen. Uh, remember that when you inject, you always have the benefit of a second injection because there's contrast that remains in the microcatheter core. Uh, so you can always do a second injection just with saline uh, to get the contrast out of the uh, core of the microcatheter and flush it at the same time. And you can take a second angle if that would help with what you're doing. Um, and the original use of these was actually as a channel dilator when traversing the septum, um, but the rotational catheters uh, can aid in dilating a channel across very tight lesions and allow uh, upscaling of your balloon sizes. So the typical is if you can cross with a microcatheter, uh, then basically every 2.0 balloon on the market should also be able to cross. Um, we talked a little bit about this. I just want to make sure I leave enough time for Jephtha. Um, so microcatheters come in different flavors. There's ones that you should just push, the Caravel and the Fine Cross. Uh, there are torqueable microcatheters, which you can rotate to change your linear friction into rotational friction, and it greatly aids in crossing tight lesions. Dual lumen, Sasuke, and Twin Pass. And then we have some specialties. Uh, Turnpike Spiral, Turnpike Gold, Supercross, and Adventure. Uh, we talked a little bit about using microcatheters to aid push, to advance through tortuosity, to access side branches, to modify the lesion. Uh, so this is uh, actually Jason Walmuth, uh, one of the CTO master's course showing actually how to rotate a microcatheter using both hands uh, to maximize your chance of crossing the lesion. Um, so we talked a little bit about spin faster. Um, 
The other thing that you can do is increase the backup. So we talked about guide support. We talked about guide extension. We talked about anchor balloons. And this is just really starting to bring all of these discussions from earlier together. Uh, sometimes there can be tip fatigue of these microcatheters, or if you're burying them against a calcified lesion, they can flare and deform. Uh, some of the lower profile microcatheters, the Turnpike LP and Corsair Pro XS, uh, may have lower profiles and better control through tortuosity. Um, you can also go to a threaded microcatheter, which is the Turnpike Spiral, or a metal tip thread, which is the Turnpike Goal or the tornus we used to, I think we still have two maybe left. Um, microcatheter removal is pretty simple. You can trap it out. You can hydroplane, which we've done in the lab. The other thing that's quite advantageous to the wiggle wire is you can just pull balloons off it slowly and carefully and the wire will stay put. Um, these are really marvels of construction, which I don't want to go into, but they're multiple braided cores uh, with a Teflon liner. And this just happens to be the structure for Turnpike, but Corsair is very similar as all the other ones are. Uh, this is just what the different ones are. The LP is the small tip. The gold is what it looks like. The spiral is to help kind of get you through lesions and anchor. And then the standard Turnpike. These are the Corsair. This is a cross section showing the multiple, multiple, very small wires that go into making these devices. Um, there's the Boston Scientific Mamba and Mamba Flex, which is very similar. It's a little bit different tip design. Most of the other ones, the tip is laser welded piece of plastic with the Mamba. The core goes through to the tip, so it decreases tip separation. Uh, it improves your crossing push, but it increases your crossing profile. Uh, the super cross catheters we have, the Venture is an angled microcatheter. You can torque by rotating this collar and the Swift Ninja. Similarly, with this dial, you can get a variety of confirmations of the tip. Dual lumen microcatheters, we have Sasuke here, but this is the uh, typical pictograph where this is an over the wire. I'm sorry, this is a monorail port distally, and there is an over the wire port proximally with a proximal marker. This is very good for accessing side branches. It gives you a base of operations here from where your push goes rather than from the guide. Uh, and it's also helpful for reverse hairpin wiring, which I have a graphic I'll show you in a second. Uh, the disadvantage is it's kind of tough to get out because you have one monorail and one over the wire catheter. And if you want to save both of those wires, uh, you really need to trap it out. That's the best way to get this done. And if you're trying to wire this complex side branch, you can't follow it with a microcatheter. You actually have to trap out and put a separate microcatheter on that. Um, so this is just the schematics of what the Sasuke is. It's an ovoid catheter, so it's larger than your typical microcatheter, but you can fit two wires in it. Um, and this is where the wire exit port is. Here's the tip, here's the marker band, here's the exit port a couple millimeters before it. So this is where your wire will actually start to exit is right here. This is where it's gonna be free enough to do some work. Uh, this is the twin pass and the twin pass torque. So this is the hairpin wire technique. So what, what we've done here is we've reversed a wire here and we're advancing it into the coronary artery. So I'll start this back here. So this is a dual lumen microcatheter here. I'm having a hard time getting it to stop. I apologize. There we go. So there's the dual lumen microcatheter. Here's the exit port. Here is the wire bent backwards. This is tracking a wire that's way down in the distal LAD. We push this back the diagonal we want to wire. And then we pull it back so that this tip engages the diagonal. And as we do that, the wire unfolds and it goes up to the diagonal. And once it's up the diagonal, then we have to stop and then trap out the dual lumen catheter and then just go over the wire in the diagonal. We've got everything that we need. 
So in summary, I think the most important thing is come to the game ready to play, anticipate the challenges of the case and address them at the start of the case. Uh, it's very rare that I've ever heard someone say they have too much guide support. So remember, we have to weigh the risks and benefits of the degree of support with what we think we'll need for the case. We talked about ways to make aggressive guides safer. Uh, we've discussed defining what the task you want the wire to do is and how to choose the wire. And remember to switch your wires to a workhorse wire once you've used a specialty wire. Microcatheters greatly improve every characteristic of the wire that you're trying to do. Uh, be flexible, don't get stuck in a rut. And if things are not working, don't spend more than a few minutes change to something else because there's only three things that don't work in the lab. It's either you're not working, which you can't really change at that point. The patient's not working. You can't really change that at the point or your gear. So the gear is the thing to change. Thank you.